Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to have the chance to speak with you today about ECTD, uh, a topic that has most certainly been very close to my heart and my work for about the last eight years. As mentioned, I, uh, I am a former US FDA employee, so I started with US FDA in 2010. I spent five and a half years there. Uh, before joining Lawrence, where now I, I continue to help with ECTD implementations around the world. So, I'm actually going to take a, a little bit different approach today, or, or maybe approach that is maybe one step higher level. Uh, my colleagues have done a, a really excellent job of explaining some very kind of difficult aspects of ECTD. So my role today, what I'd like to do now is um, to talk about really what ECTD means more from, I guess, the agency level. So what an agency is looking for f from ECTD, you know, some of the benefits of ECTD, some of the history of the creation of ECTD, um, what it actually is, even though that, that has been covered a bit already, um, steps to implement the ECTD around the world where it's currently implemented today and where we're going in the future. And then I will finish with a, a little bit about ECTD version 4. ECTD version 4 is something that is still, you know, a, a bit in the future. For now, we should stay and we should focus on the current version of ECTD, which is version 3.2.2. So everyone included the CTD or ECTD triangle in that, in their presentation, which is really great because this is the base of everything we're talking about. In the first presentation, we really heard a lot about the content of the CTD, and all of that content translates over to the ECTD as well. You have to submit the same content. You have to prepare the same content. A difference in the ECTD, as we've already heard, is you know maybe one little difference. You don't have to have those table of contents documents. So that is the part that's missing from the ECTD. And the reason for that is the ECTD itself is a table of contents. It is a set of XML files that do exactly as Katie said, they provide data about the content that you're submitting. And this allows systems both on the preparers, so on the compilation side, and then on the review or processing side to display that information to a reviewer in a structured manner. The ECTD provides both the structure and the data about the documents to ensure when it reaches the agency that every application looks the same. Every application has the same documents in the same place even though the contents of the document will be different. But that's really the advantage, and that's the reason that, that CTD and ECTD have been so successful. So in the beginning, with CTD, we had paper, and really a lot of paper. It's before my time, but everyone at the US FDA likes to tell the story about a big tractor trailer truck pulling up and unloading boxes and boxes and boxes of paper. And that paper has to be stored somewhere, it has to be cataloged, it has to be carried around the building when different people want to access things, and only so many people can access so many pieces of paper at one time. So everyone said this CTD thing is really great. We have, we have a common structure. We know the documents, we know the structure of the application will be the same every time, but now what can we do to make it better? So the, I don't expect anyone to read or necessarily even care about what it says here on the paper, but the important thing is there were lots of different groups that we're looking into. it. Lots of different groups were saying, we have this CTD, now how do we make it better and how do we make it electronic? And it finally came down to ICH and the ICH M2 group at the time. M2 still exists, but now it has a different purpose. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the ICH M2 group 
developed the original ECTD. And they decided on a common format standard for that as well, which was PDF. So we went from paper to and CTD to ECTD, which is now these electronic backbone files that describe our content, and PDF for the actual content files. That's what ECTD is made of. PDF for content files, XML that describes the content to help it make sense to reviewers, to help it put it in a common format for every application. PDF has some problems in itself, but that's the topic for kind of a later presentation as we get into to more advanced things and, and, and what's next for ECTD. We can talk about a replacement for PDF. So let's talk about ICH for a moment. Um, you know, maybe this will be a repeat from earlier in the session or, or previous days, but ICH has a couple different kinds of working groups that can exist. There's an expert working group that is, it is put together to develop a new guideline. There's an implementation working group, or IWG, that is, uh, exists to take care of an existing guideline, so to update it if changes are required. There are informal working groups in ICH, and there are discussion groups in ICH. The two that we will talk about today, the two that exist today to take care of ECTD, there's both an EWG, so an expert working group, and an IWG, an implementation working group. So back to 2010. In 2010, the ICH group M8 was formed. So before 2010, the ECTD was taken care of by ICH M2. And again, ICH M2 still exists, but now they focus on kind of more general technology things and not the ECTD itself. It was decided in 2010 that the ECTD was so important and such a big topic that it did need its own group. And that's why ICHM8 was formed. The expert working group in ICHM8 was tasked then in 2010 to develop the next generation standard, so to develop ECTD version 4. At the same time, the implementation working group was formed to, you know, to take care of the existing ECTD. So M8 exists today in that same way. There still is an expert working group for ICH M8, and there still is an IWG or implementation working group for M8 because they're both still developing ECTD version 4 and taking care of the current version of ECTD, which is version 3.2.2. So again, I already touched on this, but, but what is the ECTD? ECTD is Electronic Common Technical Document. It is an XML-based message. It organizes and provides descriptive metadata about documents and regulatory submissions. So just to reinforce what Katie said, she got it exactly right. She also stole some of my ECTD jokes, so that's, that's something I am a little bit upset about. The problem with ECTD is it can be a little bit confusing sometime whether we're, we're talking about the standard, the format, or the message itself. So ECTD really can refer to all of those things. You know, we, we, we usually focus as a tool vendor or, or as someone in industry, we're usually focused on the message. So what are we creating? the thing that we transmit back and forth to the agency. And that's really kind of what we'll focus on for the rest of the presentation today, is the ECTD message itself. So again, we are in ECTD version 3.2.2, originally released by ICH in 2008, and then you started to see agencies, so the, the ICH members and, and bigger agencies at that time, so Japan and the EU, and USFDA adopted it almost immediately and started accepting ECTD submissions almost immediately. And they're all still accepting ECTD version 322 messages. That is the current version. And we heard um, 
from Katie that, that that usage is becoming mandatory in more and more regions. So in the US FDA, it, it is mandatory today for most application types. In the EU, it will continue to become mandatory for more and more application types. And more and more regions are now starting optional use, while other regions will be pushing for mandatory use in the future. So the, the role and the acceptance and usage of ECTD-322 is going to just continue to grow. So let's talk about, um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the ICH specifications and the regional specifications. These uh, on the page here are the list of specifications that are managed by ICH. These really do not change very often for ECTD version 3. They are set, especially kind of the core ECTD specification version and the STF specification version. Uh, they, they do not change very often. I would not see them changing again very much in the future. In addition to those documents, um, we have a couple that are changing or a couple that are evolving. And those are, for example, the question and answer and specification change request document. This is one that is located out there on the ICH website. And since the, the ECTD version 3 is a living specification, there are questions that are submitted to ICH and answers to those questions and recommendations on how to use the standard are put into this document and this document is published. So ICH meets generally twice a year. So you would generally see updates to this document, this Q&A document, twice a year. Sometimes uh, you would have a cycle where you do not receive questions. You don't need to make updates. But generally, I think you should expect to see updates to that a few times a year. Something that is new is the specification for submission formats. So previously, uh, kind of a, a few years back, this document did not exist. And it was up to each individual region to say what kind of documents they accepted and how they should be formatted. This document really talks about how to create PDFs and how to create what we call e-submission ready PDFs. And, and both presenters earlier touched on this and did a very good job. This really is, in my opinion, one of the harder things about preparing for ECTD. And you cannot, uh, you cannot start this, I would say, cannot start it early enough, and you cannot push it far enough up the chain. And what I mean is by the time that a document gets to your publishing team, who's actually in the publishing tool and assigning a document to a specific place, this document needs to have been finalized and needs to have been made ready for ECTD months before that, weeks if not months before that. So the, the earlier that you can get your medical writing group or your CROs or the people who are providing you these documents, the earlier that you can get them involved and the earlier that you can make them understand the requirements for PDF documents, the easier your submission process will be at the end in the compilation step. So it's a very, very important thing. This document, again, is new. Um, it, it talks, it is published now by ICH, but it doesn't mean that they, that the individual regions don't have some slight differences or variations on what is required. So you will always need to check the region and the regional specifications for especially things like font or language or margins. These, these are things that will be different in different regions. The ICH now also manages the ICH ECTD version 4 implementation package. It's out there. Uh, I would not necessarily worry about it yet. 
Again, the, the ECTD version 3 is going to be around for quite some time. And if you're starting with ECTD, ECTD version 3 is still the, the right place to be starting and the right place to, to, uh, to put your effort today. Katie did a good job of, of walking us through some of this. And, and when we actually talk about the ECTD message itself, the message is, you know, exactly as it says here, it's a set of files and folders organized in a certain way according to specifications with some XML backbones that describe the content. So we have content files here, like our introduction.pdf or our cover letter.pdf and they get assigned to certain places in the folder structure based on those specifications. The good thing is that if you're using kind of any one of the modern publishing tools out there, you really shouldn't have to worry about this. The publishing tool should be taking care of this, it should be assigning things to their correct location. So the publishing tool should know that cover letters go in the module one folder and the regional file goes in the module one folder. And after you've input all your information, it should spit something out that's compliant. So it's good to understand what the, uh, what the published output should look like. But at the same time, it really is a place where you need to rely on the publishing tool and rely that the publishing tool is going to be doing this for you correctly. Our content files here, the, the examples that we have are PDF. Um, there are situations where you would need to include other content files in your submission. Um, things like Microsoft Word documents are sometimes required. Things like study data files, which are our SAS transport files for US FDA, for example, are required. Um, the tools generally don't care about the content files. You can bring the content file in, and as long as you assign it to its right place and you give it a valid name, as long as you're not validated, or as long as you're not violating the validation specifications, then you should be able to bring that content in and assign it, and the tool should include it in the package. The ECTD is, again, it's just a message or a transport mechanism. We saw in the previous picture that there were two different backbone files. There's the ICH backbone file, and the ICH backbone file, you know, it, it is the one that's controlled by ICH, and it is the information that's available and the, the headings that are available in module two through five. And then you have the regional backbone file. The regional backbone file is the information, that, so both the headings and the envelope section that Katie mentioned that are available for each region or each national authority. And the national authority will have to specify that. They'll have to say, this is what our module one looks like. And most times it's going to look the same between the CTD and the ECTD, minus that table of contents, because the, again, the ECTD itself is an XML table of contents for the entire submission. The envelope is something that, that's very interesting. I, I think Katie did a good job of explaining what it is. Uh, you know, the envelope is really used to both kind of process and classify information when it gets to the regulatory authority. So for example, the United States just did a really big update of their envelope. I say, I say just, even though it has been a few years now, it's still relatively new in the world of ECTD. And their goal was to build an envelope structure that allowed them to classify things better in their internal tracking systems. And that means it provided them with a way to very specifically put together regulatory activities. So an original application, and then all of the changes or amendments to the original application, and then maybe there's a variation, and all the changes and amendments belong to that specific variation. The envelope was structured in such a way that it can be very clear in the internal tracking system 
and in the ECTD review system, what belongs together and what should be reviewed or approved as a kind of a unit or a regulatory activity. So that, that's really the role, one of the roles of the envelope and, and where we are seeing the envelope go as more and more regions kind of update their information and, and go and kind of make the ECTD more sophisticated in the future. They're, they're getting better and better at doing that and, and at, at putting that information together in review and tracking systems. And again, we've, we've already touched on this, but the, at the agency side and, you know, at the same time on your compilation tool that you use to create ECTD, things will generally be organized by an application folder and then sequence folders under it and then folders and subfolders under that. And, and this structure is, you know, the structure either is required by ICH or it is required by the regional authority. And again, your, your ECTD compilation tool should take care of that for you. You shouldn't have to worry that that's incorrect using a modern tool. All right, so that is kind of the, the background and history and introduc introduction section for ECTD. So let's talk about where it's actually used around the world. Um, you know, today I would say we have nine regions, 44 countries, and 47 agencies, um, with Jordan being the, the newest addition to that. Uh, Jordan's not actually accepting ECTD yet, but they have released kind of a, a draft version of their specification, so we, we did include them here in the graphic. The, the use of ECTD around the world it, is just expanding, and it will continue to expand. Now we see at the bottom, you know, hopefully we have at least four more regions coming soon, uh, list, listed here in, in no particular order. So what does it actually take to implement ECTD in a region? This doesn't even include a lot of work that needs to happen, you know, even before we get to the start of this. Before we get to even the start of this, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, for example, join ICH, make a commitment to implementing CTD, make a commitment to implementing ECTD, you know, analyze and see really if industry locally and around the world is ready for a new region to accept ECTD. Analyze and make sure that it makes sense for that region to implement ECTD at that time based on workload, based on all the other projects happening in the agency. So this kind of gets us to the point where a specific authority or agency or region has said, okay, I'm going to take the step. I'm going to start with, with my, my implementation of ECTD internally. So what do I need to do? And we'll talk quite a bit about these, these documents that are listed here in a few moments and what their roles are. But it really starts with kind of specification development. And it really starts with the idea of, you know, does your region or agency or authority already know about things like what are my application, <clears throat> excuse me, what are my application types? What are my submission types or regulatory activities? So do I have an original application? And then do I have variations that are allowed under the same application? In many regions, that's true. In some regions, it's not. For example, in Japan, a variation would become its own application. So it's kind of a separate thing. And these are really the kind of business rules and dependencies that have to be captured and have to be developed in order to write an ECTD specification package. Because that's the expectation, that that ECTD specification package will be able to be understood by industry, and then industry will be able to say, I know what you need me to do to submit ECTD. I know what the expectation is to build a dossier or application to build a regulatory activity and to group things together. 
And that's really kind of at the highest level and, and the most important thing about ECTD before we get into all the details like, like um, metadata that needs to go in module three or life cycle information that goes on an individual document. That stuff is really, really, really important. But kind of for industry, the most important thing to understand is what are the business rules and processes for some, for creation and submission of ECTD for my region before a region can move forward. So we would say that kind of once a, a region has made an agreement or has, has taken a decision to implement ECTD, it could take up to 24 months. So it could take up to two years to actually develop those specification documents. Some regions will go much faster than that um, for, you know, maybe for reasons like they already understand all that information, they already know it, and now they just need to translate it into electronic form or because of political pressure or other things. So it's most certainly possible to go faster or slower than that. But generally, I think from what we've seen, a, a good, um, you know, a good, well-thought implementation does take quite some time. We do like to, uh, we like agencies to give industry some time to look at the information that's been published to make sure they understand it. Maybe there is a public comment period. Maybe there's a chance for revision of those documents. Now, that could take, you know, maybe up to another year. And, uh, and as mentioned earlier, this would be the time when your tool vendors now look at the specifications and can implement that in the tool, can create a new version of the tool, and can push that out to industry, push that out to their customers and do training and, and help them understand how to use the new version. The agency would then maybe do a pilot review, so maybe allow the submission of um, you know, fake data. Uh, sometimes that happens somewhere like Health Canada. They like to do what they call a non-functional pilot, which means we're going to allow you to submit a, a fake or made-up dossier just so we can check all of the different uh, technical parts of it without having to worry about the content. So really the, the content shouldn't be changing. What we should be looking at are the specifications or the technical content of the submission. Can they process it? Can they validate it? Does it match up with what they're expecting to see in their other systems, in their tracking systems? Because we live now in, in a very connected world with systems where agencies have not just the ECTD review tool, but they also have kind of automated processing systems. They have automated validation systems, and they have other tracking systems that help track workload or, or um, you know, assignment of individual reviewers to specific applications. And all that integration takes quite some time. And then finally, we get to our production phase, where, where an authority or an agency is accepting production ECTDs. You know, so here we have three and a half years. It could take up to three and a half years. It most certainly can be done faster. It most certainly could be done slower. So let's talk a little bit about what's required or what's needed for regional ECTD specifications. You know, we would have, for example, a regional specification document, which is usually a PDF file that talks in narrative format about how to create or how to put information into the ECTD, for example, that envelope section or how to build regulatory activities, or how to do life cycle, or what fonts are required, or what margins are required on PDFs, et cetera, et cetera. So these documents can look different in different regions. Um, some of them are very straightforward, and some of them are, are very big and, and harder to maintain. There's a technical package, which is, is what we call the DTD or schema. That's kind of what controls the technical validation. It's what allows a machine to look at your submission and make sure it's valid and the agency can process it. What allows the machine to do validation. There are things like controlled vocabularies, which um, is a concept that allows agencies to update their specifications more 
easily, but these are kind of helper or, or XML files that are going to be on the side of the package or included in the package. Again, for technical package items, it's important to know that they're out there. It's important to know what they do, but really you should be relying on your ECTD tool vendor to digest the information, to implement it successfully, and provide you with a software that works, that's compatible with these things. The validation criteria have, have a pretty unique role because it's necessary both for machines, again, for machines to look at these things in a programmatic way and do validation of the, of the message, but it's also something that can be very useful for humans to read and understand because sometimes this also explains the business rules about how to create submissions or how to fill submissions or, or how to put information in submissions. So validation criteria can have kind of a dual purpose. And then sometimes we have additional documents um, in a regional implementation package. You might have a how to submit document, which says send a DVD to this address and make sure you put your return address on it and make sure you put a label on it, and but don't put the label on the DVD. These can get quite complicated. Um, and sometimes it's necessary for regions, for example, that don't have a gateway solution yet. So if you have an electronic submission gateway, it might be very straightforward. You must use the electronic submission gateway. Not all regions have that today. And some regions actually provide sample submissions. So sample submissions that you can take and you can create a sample submission and import it into your compilation system to, to review and get used to working with samples for that region or actually to, uh, to get used to business rules. It's another good place where business rules can be can be illustrated for a specific region. So I do have some additional information about each one of those documents in the next few slides. You know, we did start to talk that, about that already. Um, that regional specification document, again, it's, it's very often in PDF format. It may include things like PDF e-submission readiness right in that specification document or that could be a separate document. You know, for example, in the US, it's a separate document. They have their module one specification, and then they have their PDF specification. You have to use them both together to create a valid submission. The technical package we talked about already a bit uh, does provide those instructions to machines on how to create and validate the message. Again, these, these things like style sheets and DTD or schema files, it's important to understand that they guide the building or creation of the message. But again, leave it, leave it to everyone else to really worry about how they're implemented. The validation criteria, really interesting validation criteria and, and really interesting differences in validation criteria kind of across the world. Um, if you're only submitting to one region, it's straightforward. You have one set of validation criteria. It's probably easy to understand. The agency is probably consistent in what they accept or what they don't accept. If you start submitting to different agencies around the world, you may have very different validation criteria for different agencies. For example, for the US FDA, you can submit your sequences in whatever order you would like to submit. You can submit sequence one and then sequence five and then sequence two. Most places around the world, most of the other agencies, you cannot do that. And it would fail validation and you would receive a rejection of your submission. It's also important to, to understand that there are you know, the things, the errors or the high validation errors that lead to a rejection, this is usually an immediate rejection. It usually means I tried to send something to the agency and I received an error and they're not going to accept it. They're going to delete it from their systems. They're going to pretend it never existed. You can feel free to try again. 
the other things, the warnings or the informations, they will most likely be accepted by the agency. The agency may start a review. Uh, if the agency would discover that there are multiple warnings or warnings that become so severe that they cannot review the submission, it's possible that they would either go back and issue a rejection or they may ask you to resubmit information, to resubmit or life cycle documents. So important to understand that, important to understand how each agency uses that information and what their guidelines are for the different levels. You should al always be validating before you send to the agency, for sure. But that is really, it is one of the first steps when something comes to the agency for, for every agency out there. You must pass that validation before it will be accepted, before it will be taken in and, and regulatory review can really start. Some regions are now starting to do, you know, more than just technical validation. So they'll start to actually do what we call a business or content validation. And what that means is if you're sending a certain submission type, some regions will look and say, you're supposed to have documents in module 231 and module 321, and you don't have them there. This is business or content validation. This does not happen at every agency. But it does happen a place, I think Australia was, was one of the first that really started to do this. And I think you're really going to see other agencies continue in that trend. So it will be something that becomes a part of that uh, validation in the future. So important to understand that as well. It's actually, I think, very helpful. It's very helpful to, to help you understand the expectations of what a valid submission looks like. I think it's a, a good step for the industry. Additional documents that you might see in, in these regional ECTD specifications, you might see regional Q&A documents, you right, might see regional conformance guides. Uh, again, my experience is, is very much U.S. focused, so I can speak quite a bit about what the U.S. does. The U.S. has uh, what they call an ECTD technical conformance guide, and it goes even further than the specifications and even further than the validation. And it really talks about best practices for submissions. So it talks about what they expect to see for things like your leaf or document titles. It talks about how to fix some of the common errors. Like you have a, a life cycle error in a certain section. It gives some examples of that and how to fix them. And again, those sample ECTD submissions sometimes can be very helpful. Sometimes they require you to be able to read XML or have someone who can read XML. Uh, but if you can find someone to help you turn that into an XML file, it can be useful to, to, to load that and, and gain experience with that with your, in your own uh, organization. So I've touched on this a little bit already. You know, we, we, we've really talked about kind of the, the history of ECTD why ECTD is important, um, how ECTD is implemented around the world, and how it will continue to be implemented around the world. Um, take just a moment and talk about the role of the ECTD tool vendor, since that's where I'm coming from today. The ECTD tool vendor is, is really there to allow you to create and submit compliant messages. And that's really the most basic part of it. Tool vendors will have compilation tools, primarily used by industry. We'll have validation tools that are used both at industry before you submit that message and at the agency when they receive it, they'll use the same or, or sometimes different validation tool. And you'll have review tools that are used um, both in the industry and agency. Some tool vendors offer the same tool for compilation and review. Some offer different tools for compilation and review. So really what you should be looking for from the compilation side and the validation side is choose a vendor that you trust and know can help you create compliant submissions. 
And that really means taking care of all of those technical things that we talked about today. Your tool vendor should be your partner in doing that and your partner in looking at specification updates and providing you with new versions of software when it's necessary and informing you when specification updates are coming. It's also a, a very good and important role of the CTD tool vendor. After that, there are lots of other things that compilation tools can do for you. Some of them, um, well, they all have different ways of creating hyperlinks and managing applications and you have to, to take a look at that as well to, to see what fits your practices. Maybe you have a very simple operation or very simple publishing operation and maybe you don't need all those features. Maybe you have a very complex publishing operation and maybe you need to submit to multiple countries and multiple regions. So maybe you need more advanced features. So you can, you can look out there and, and there is definitely a, a wide variety and wide capability of different tool vendors out there. But at the end of the day, have to make sure that we are submitting, creating and submitting compliance submissions. That is the most important thing. So a little bit more about compliance. Um, and there, there won't be a quiz on this later, on this kind of information, but ECTD does have quite a long history at this point and there have been you know, a lot of different updates regionally. So if you are one of those um, organizations that wants to submit to different regions, um, or you have a, a long history of ECTD submission, it's important to be able to, you know, kind of both import and then continue lifecycle on all the different regional variations that are out there. It gets quite, quite complicated. Um, but the point here really is that, you know, the, that should also be the role of the tool vendor. The tool vendor should be able to help you understand what it is that you're doing, where it is you're going, and where it is you're coming from to help you pick and help you either, uh, you know, get started or continue with, um, with ECTD for different regions. And the same here, we, we have a lot of different specification versions out there. We have a lot of different schema versions out there and we have a lot of different validation criteria out there. So it does get quite complex when you look at all of it, when you look at the world. It's much easier if you are submitting to just one region and hopefully when you're submitting to just one region, you have a version one specification, you have a version one schema and a version one validation, and you only have to understand that. But the world of ECTD can get quite complicated. Sometimes changes to a specification document don't require a change to the underlying technical files. Sometimes they do. Sometimes a new submission type has to be added, and that requires a change to specifications or a change to control vocabulary. Sometimes the, um, the specification document just gets updated to because someone had to change their address. They had to change the address of the agency. So all of these things could lead to updates in specification documents. Again, reach out and work with your tool vendor and they will help you understand what it means. What it means when there's an update and what it means and what the most, uh, what the most current version is for each region. So that's a lot about the current ECTD. It's a lot about the current ECTD, including some background and history, um, you know, where we've come from. Uh, now let's talk about where we're going. So the future of ECTD, it, it really just is increased adoption of ECTD version three, version 3.2.2 specifically. So we expect more and more regions to come on board with version three. And we expect more and more regions to expect that you do ECTD, even mandating its use, sometimes by law, sometimes by regulation. The EU national procedures in January 2019 is a very good example of that. The, the mandatory use in Australia is another good example of that. So these are regions that have enough experience with ECTD version 3 
that they feel like it's time that they can force everyone to use it. Talk about something here called structured contents, not something that I'll go into a lot today, but this is something that will be kind of the, the replacement for PDF in some parts of the application. So you already have this used in places like labeling in the US. There's something called a structured product label, and it's a different format. Um, sometimes it needs to be included as part of your ECTD. The different regions are looking at module three, so the quality section of the ECTD today. And they're saying there's probably a better way to get this information than just in a PDF file. So essentially in digital paper, where it's hard to take that information and do analysis on it. It's hard to take that information and put it in other systems. So agencies more and more are going to be looking for ways to structure that content, to put it, for example, in XML format, where then they can pull it out of the ECTD and take it and put it in a different database and do lifecycle, do um, you know, updates on that information and really create product databases and, and really create uh, information um, we're going to call it master data management about what is all of the information that I'm managing as an agency and how do I manage that more easily. So it's something that that's coming as the kind of the, the ECTD evolves, the content of the ECTD will evolve. And then ECTD version 4. So we've heard a couple teasers about ECTD version 4 today. Again, it's not something that I would be worried about today. The, we did a pilot of ECTD4 with some of our customers and with one of the regulatory authorities. And really what we took away from that was people were surprised at how much working with ECTD4 was just like working with ECTD3. So really at the end of the day, you are just taking content files and you're still assigning them to the correct ECTD heading, and you're still assigning some metadata about them, like giving the document a title and giving that information in module three um, some metadata. And then at the end of all of that, your publishing tool spits out a very different looking message. And again, the good news is that you don't necessarily have to worry about that. The message may look very different in the background, but the way of working with it and the way of assigning information and metadata will be very similar. Uh, ECTD version 4 is still two to three years away from any kind of even optional use in any of the big regions. And, and the big regions that are pushing are USA, Canada, EU, Japan are, are the, the farthest ahead with ECTD 4 today. It's, they're all still two to three years away. I, there absolutely are some benefits for ECTD version 4. Um, again, not a lot that I'd like to, I think, go into today. I think you've, you've already had a lot of information thrown at you this morning. Um, I hope that, that this was helpful. I hope you learned a bit about ECTD, about the history, about its current use, about how it's being adopted around the world. Um, about what will be required to implement it in a new region that doesn't have ECTD today, and then a little bit about where ECTD is going in the future. So thank you very much.